algo así, ya me lo describo. At the old American club in Havana, a mock trial is underway. The accused has been the most wanted man in Latin America for over 30 years. Vamos a demostrar, tratar de demostrar por qué Luis Faustino Clemente Posada Garrigues, eh, quien estaba a cargo de la ejecución de todas y cada una de, estas de, de estos actos terroristas contra Cuba. Luis Posada Carriles is being tried in absentia for multiple acts of terrorism, which have killed scores of people. No es lo que dice nadie. Lieutenant Colonel Francisco Estrada from the Interior Ministry has spent the last 10 years investigating these crimes. Va a lograr un día que alguien decente pare la impunidad y ponga a Posada donde tiene que estar. Y el banquillo los ha acusado en algún lugar. In 2005, the 77 year old Posada was protesting his innocence in Texas. The governments of Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua all want him to stand trial. But when he turned up in the United States with a false passport two years ago, he was only charged with immigration offenses. The Posada was named Mohammed, and instead of being from Cuba, nationalized Venezuelan citizen, was instead from Saudi Arabia. Uh, you can bet your bottom dollar that Posada Garriles would have been extradited quick, quicker you could sneeze. But Posada is not only a Cuban naturalized Venezuelan citizen, but he's a CIA operative, so it's a much more difficult case. In a career spanning almost half a century, Luis Posada Carriles has dedicated his life to a crusade against communism, in particular Fidel Castro. And for much of that time, he was working with the CIA. Posada Carriles is the most notorious terrorist in the Western Hemisphere. He's responsible for torture and murder in places as far away as Panama, Venezuela, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Cuba. Uh, he has participated in terrorist acts since the early 1960s. This Cuban documentary looks at the worst of the crimes blamed on Posada, the blowing up of a Cuban civilian airplane in Barbados in 1976. 73 people on board were killed, including the National Youth Fencing Team. Nine days later, more than a million Cubans gathered to pay tribute to the dead. Until the September 11 attacks, the bombing of Cubana Flight 455 was described as the deadliest act of terrorism in the Americas. The pilot's last recorded words were a desperate plea for help. Odelis Perez Rodriguez was 10 years old when her father's last words were recorded. Durante todos estos años el dolor en nuestra familia y para mí se ha convertido en algo muy triste. Esa ese amor de abuelo y de padre no lo pude no lo pude sentir. Muchas gracias por respirar. The co-pilot also left a 10-year-old daughter behind. And 
que tal vez ha sido una óptago. Siempre han albergado mis esperanzas, que sé que no son realidades, pero que han hecho sufrir durante todos estos 30 años. From the sea, were recovered only nine of the 73 bodies. And those nine bodies that were recovered were pieces of bodies. You can understand why the family members would want the person responsible for this, the mastermind of this gross murder, to be tried for it. La historia de lo que estamos viendo hoy no es más que la historia de la continuidad de la protección del gobierno norteamericano a Posada Carriles de no encauzarlo como terrorista porque sería encauzarse a sí mismo por ser los jefes de Posada Carriles en toda su historia de acciones contra Cuba. He terminado. Para Fiscalía es suficiente. The Luis Posada Carriles story is also the story of U.S. interference in Latin America. Way back in 1961, Posada was one of the anti-Castro exiles trained by the CIA to take part in a failed invasion of Cuba. But he never made it to the Bay of Pigs. Instead, he studied demolition, propaganda and intelligence, becoming second lieutenant in the US Army. Posada moved to Miami in 1964 and by his own admission continued to plot Castro's overthrow with the full support of the CIA. These old war horses in Miami's Little Havana still fantasize about Castro's demise. <laughs> to them, Posada is not a terrorist, but a freedom fighter. No fue responsable de la voladura de, del avión. ¿No? No. Y eso es lo que piensa casi todo el mundo aquí, ¿no? Que... No, no, y en Cuba. Estaba el gobierno de Fidel Castro. Y, y para los que dicen que Posada pues, Carriles es un terrorista y no sé qué. No, para eso no tenemos nosotros respuesta. Le decimos que opinen lo que quieran. Pero nosotros lo que nos interesa es Fidel Castro. In 1968, Posada moved from Miami to Caracas, where he became chief of operations for Venezuelan intelligence. He's boasted about fighting a very dirty war against Cuban-backed communist guerrillas. Caracas, I managed to track down two women who were prisoners of Posada in 1972. Marlene Esquivel says that Posada, now calling himself Commissioner Basilio, even tortured her three-week-old baby. Varios oportunidades le pegó así el cigarrillo. Entró a agarrar y le tapaba el mismo comisario Basilio le tapaba la nariz a la niña. Yo no la podía. Yo lo que hacía era moverla. Para que no, bueno, buscando de. Pero sí, me la torturaron bastante, me le ponían un revólver aquí y alaban el gatillo así y emitían ruido durísimo como de un disparo. Bueno, eso fue. Eight months pregnant at the time, Marlene's sister Brenda says Posada, a.k.a. Basilio, gave the order to kill her unborn child. Entonces le dice comisario Basilio, la señora está embarazada, le faltan días, ¿qué, ¿qué hacemos con ella? Y le dijo, mate esa semilla antes de que nazca. Acaba con esa semilla antes de que nazca. She says they kicked and punched her stomach until she miscarried. Two years later, with a change of government, Posada lost his job as intelligence chief, but this didn't slow him down at all. During the mid-70s, Venezuela was booming and Posada Carriles was a busy man. He ran a private detective agency out of this house in East Caracas. The office became an important front in the clandestine war against Fidel Castro. Among his 36 employees were the two Venezuelans who planted the bomb on flight 455, Hernán Ricardo and Freddy Lugo. This was the first time a civilian aircraft had been blown out of the sky 
in an act of mid-air terrorism. Within a few days, Lugo and Ricardo were arrested in Trinidad. They confessed and led investigators straight to Posada. We have the confessions of the two individuals who placed the bombs on the plane, and Nan Ricardo and Freddy Lugo, admitting that uh, they did in fact do this, that they were uh, CIA operatives, that they uh, worked with uh, Luis Posada Carriles in Caracas, that um, they placed telephone calls to Luis Posada Carriles the day of the uh, downing of the plane, frantically looking for him to give him these coded words. The, the bus has crashed and the dogs are dead. Posada has trouble speaking because he was shot in the face in a 1990 assassination attempt. At a press conference two years ago, he said he had nothing to do with the bombing. You're not considered guilty because you have, uh, you're close to someone who is found guilty. In the United States, someone is innocent until proven guilty. Radio presenter Ninosca Perez Castellon is the voice of hardline Cuban exiles in Miami. It's not what the Cuban government says, it's not what the Venezuelan government says. I mean, they have enough crimes on their hands to be uh, accusing others. They call everybody a terrorist, they call me a terrorist, they call everybody a terrorist. And, you know, you don't do that unless you have the proof. That is the way that it's done in a democracy. In fact, there are dozens of declassified documents from the CIA and FBI which paint a damning picture of Posada. Until at least June 1976, he worked with the CIA, which was then headed by George Bush, the father of the current president. Back then, there were serious concerns about Posada's links to organized crime, as this CIA report shows. Posada may be involved in smuggling cocaine from Colombia through Venezuela to Miami, also in counterfeit US money in Venezuela. Another CIA memo from three months before the bombing reveals foreknowledge of a planned attack. Possible plans of Cuban exile extremists to blow up a Cubana airliner. But this information was never passed on to the Cuban authorities. This FBI document, written just two days after the bombing, shows that Posada and fellow anti-Castro militant Orlando Bosch were the first suspects. The source all but admitted that Posada and Bosch had engineered the bombing of the airline. Orlando Bosch and Posada Carriles were both arrested in Venezuela just days after the bombing. But although Bosch and Posada were held in jail for several years, they were never convicted. One of the judges, uh, one of the military judges actually talked about the pressure that was being put on the government. Um, to not charge them or to absolve them. Um, the pressure was tremendous. California-based journalist and author Anne Louise Badak has written the definitive books on Cuba and the Cuban exiles in Miami. She's probably also the only person to have interviewed both Fidel Castro and Posada Carriles. This is a painting that Luis Posada gave me when I was in Aruba. Even though she was clearly charmed, Badak says it's impossible to ignore the evidence of Posada's involvement in the bombing. My personal estimation, and again, I come from this from finding him quite personable, and I was, because he's so personable, you sort of want to believe his story. But I'm sorry to say that the evidence that I've looked at extensively does not leave much wiggle room. In 1985, Posada escaped from jail, fled Venezuela, and went back to work for the Americans. He soon became a key player in the Iran-Contra affair, a covert operation to bring down Nicaragua's government.
Ronald Reagan was in the White House, and his vice president was none other than former CIA chief George Bush. One thing about the Reagan and uh, Bush administration is they had no illusions that the people who did dirty work had to be a little dirty themselves. And they wanted to run a secret war. They wanted people to do guerrilla actions. And they knew they weren't going to get those people out of Harvard and Yale. When the scandal broke, Colonel Oliver North famously started shredding the evidence. And Posada says he also did his bit covering up for the White House. He said he ferried the American personnel out and that he destroyed very incriminating documents. And he's, what he, he said it to me suggesting that the U.S. government owes him something for having done this. In 1997, Posada reactivated his war on Cuba. Bombs began exploding in hotels and restaurants in the capital, Havana. In all, seven people were injured and a 32-year-old Italian tourist was killed. Later, in an interview that he may yet regret, he told journalist Anne-Louise Bardak what he'd hoped to achieve. The purpose of it, as he explained to me, was not to really kill people and not to cause death and destruction, but it was to scare off investment and tourism so that the embargo on Castro and Cuba would be total and bring down the government. He didn't want to be implicated in the killing of a tourist. What he wanted was publicity for the bombings. He wanted people to say, my God, it's dangerous down there. I can't go. Esto es un, una pintura que está pintada hace un año. One of the bombs killed Giustino Di Chelmo's son, Fabio. Di Chelmo, an Italian, now lives in Havana. Yo veo a Fabio en todas las calles de La Habana. Lo veo siempre. Para mí Fabio no está muerto. Entonces un buen padre tiene que quedarse y cuidar a su hijo. Fidel Castro made Giustino general manager of an Italian restaurant named after his son. Posada told Anne Louise Bardak that Fabio's death was regrettable. And he referred to him as the most unlucky guy in the world. He said, it's too bad that somebody died, but we can't stop because somebody died. And he didn't stop. Osada's next target was Fidel Castro himself. In 2000, Castro was in Panama City for a summit and dramatically announced that Posada was there too, planning to assassinate him. Es el tristemente celebre Luis Posada Carriles. Cuban intelligence released surveillance footage of Posada in Panama City. It said the plan was to blow up the university auditorium where Castro was due to address Panamanian students. Entrenados en el arte de matar, capaces de estudiar a sangre fría, donde y cómo colocar las bombas. Posada was sentenced to eight years prison, but released after only four. What you hear in Miami is there was a, a considerable payoff made. That is what you hear on both sides of the left and right is that it involved money, which would not be the first time in Panamanian politics <laughs> that somebody got out of prison because somebody paid a, a bribe. Posada has been immortalized on the internet for his ability to escape justice. Dateline found this animation on the YouTube website. When he arrived in the United States in March 2005, Posada became a veritable hot potato for the Bush administration. Posada Carriles, by his own admission, has been a CIA operative for decades, and that he has a lot of secrets to tell. And some of those secrets take him directly back to President Bush's father. But it seems he had very little to worry about, as Anne-Louise Bardak discovered when she met with a high-level source at the FBI. And he said, you better, you better sit down. He said in August 2003, 
they closed the Posada case and then greenlighted it for destruction. Why did the FBI, when it chose to do some house cleaning, destroy the files and evidence of the most important case they had in that building? Why? It's Miami. Dateline sent the FBI a detailed list of questions, but a spokesperson would only say it was standard procedure to dispose of evidence when a case is closed. We cannot provide details of the Luis Posada Carriles investigation, past or present. There is a current investigation into Posada Carriles, however, I cannot comment any further. Last month in Texas, the immigration charges against Posada were dismissed by a federal district court judge. Reports of this on Cuban and Venezuelan television created outrage. Camilo Rojo's father died on the plane brought down by Posada's henchmen. Soltar a Posada Carrile es como negar que mi padre ha muerto. Soltar a Posada Carrile es como negar los 30 años de sufrimiento que llevo por, por la ausencia de mi padre. Es como negar eso. The U.S. government has announced it will appeal the decision to dismiss the charges against Posada. The Justice Department refused Dateline's request for an interview, but a spokesperson emailed this response. The U.S. government takes seriously the allegations of terrorism leveled against Mr. Posada. Mr. Posada remains under investigation for his past activities. Since being released, Posada has been spending time in Miami's Little Havana, where he knows he's safe. Dateline would like to have interviewed Posada Carriles, but he's been following his lawyer's advice to make no comment. What makes his release so particularly dangerous is that Posada Carriles has never been the one to actually put bombs in buildings. He has directed others to do so. And now that he is free to roam the streets of Miami, where so many of his fellow terrorists seem to be hiding, uh, Posada Carriles is free to direct them to continue their terrorist ways. And that's why so many people are concerned. Two weeks ago, the Venezuelan government renewed its request for Posada's extradition. However, the U.S. Justice Department told Dateline extradition could not be granted because it was more likely than not that he would be tortured if he were so transferred. Back in Havana, Posada's mock trial is reconvening for the verdict now outdoors, in direct earshot of the American diplomatic mission. Few people here have any faith in American justice. And even in Washington, some congressmen are asking questions about America's relationship with Posada. I've spoken to congressmen and their aides who are appalled at the way the White House has protected this terrorist. The scandalous thing here is the way the United States government, in the midst of a so-called war against terrorism, has coddled and protected this particular terrorist. Si mañana apareciera Bin Laden en un país X o lo soltaran como han soltado a Posada Carriles, ¿cómo reaccionaría el gobierno norteamericano? ¿Cómo reaccionaría el pueblo norteamericano? Reaccionarían de forma indignada, molestos, reaccionarían ofendidos. 